Hello, welcome to Sound and Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I am Tina. Today I'm doing a book review of The Terraformers by Annalee Newitz. This is a book from Tor. It came out January 2023. It's a sci-fi, cli-fi, eco-fiction book. So this book is the Interstellar Book Club's pick for whatever month we're in, September. <laughs> <laughs> and the live show discussion is coming up. I'm actually going to be hosting it. I believe it will be on the last Saturday of the month or at 11 a.m. EST or so, but I will post a thing on here. You can post things on here, right? <laughs> Letting you know. So come watch myself and Steph from Coffee Over Apples discuss this book because I'm really, really, really excited to talk about it because I seem to be the only person I think in the book club that really, really liked it. And so I would love to have a discussion with someone who wasn't super into it because I'd like to see their perspective. And we'll see if their perspective changes my perspective compared to this review now. So I got this book on BookBub for like a dollar for my tablet. So that was great, <laughs> which is also why I voted for it for this month for the book club, because <laughs> I'm nothing if not cheap. Uh, yeah, so because this book isn't an arc, I know, shocking. I know I seem to only review arcs uh, other than classic sci-fi. I did look at reviews because I was curious and it seems like I'm in the minority here. Most reviewers I've seen have not been thrilled with this novel. Goodreads, you know, Goodreads sucks. But the average on there is 3.36, which in the industry, unless you're in romance, as romance readers are low raters on average, that's not the best ranking. So uh, clearly I was in the minority, as I said. I really liked it. <laughs> so uh, what is it about? Destry is a top network analyst with the Environmental Rescue Team, an ancient organization devoted to preventing ecosystem collapse. On the planet Sask E, her mission is to terraform an Earth-like world with the help of her taciturn moose, Whistle. But then she discovers a city that isn't supposed to exist, hidden inside a massive volcano. Torn between loyalty to the ERT and the truth of the planet's history, Destry makes a decision that echoes down the generations. Centuries later, Destiny's protege, Misha, is building a planet-wide transit system when his worldview is turned upside down by Sulphur, a brilliant engineer from the Volcano City. Together they uncover a dark secret about the real estate company that's buying up huge swathes of the planet, a secret that could destroy the lives of everyone who isn't homo sapiens. Working with a team of robots, naked mole rats, and a very angry cyborg cow, they quietly sow seeds of subversion. But when they're threatened with violent diaspora, Maisha and Sulphur's very unusual child faces a stark choice. Deploy a planet-altering weapon or watch their people lose everything they've built on Sask E. This book is told in three separate segments set centuries apart. It's unabashedly climate fiction, dealing with themes of responsible terraforming, corporations overlooking or circumventing environmental protection laws, and colonialism, particularly regarding treaties. Now, despite these heavy themes, I would argue the book's greatest strength and its greatest weakness is how cozy it is. There are flying moose in this book, <laughs> evolved animals that can talk, little romances here and there, friendship. The book has a real utopia versus dystopia feel to it in that we're rooting for the society that is very inclusive and wants everything to be happy and, you know, fair and eco-minded versus the dystopian corporate overlords which I mean is a very typical theme. <laughs> I think the main problem though is the fact that it's too obviously about this. It definitely takes, it definitely is not an allegory, but it's very didactic about its purposes. <laughs> Even though I myself am a huge environmentalist, like to the point I know my friends roll their eyes behind their back at me and I've pretty much cut out most meat, except for salmon, I can't cut out salmon, uh, from my diet, uh, things like that. Uh, but there are even lines in this that, while I kind of agreed with most of it, went overboard. <laughs> so at one point there's a dairy farm and the characters are horrified by the idea of drinking milk from an animal. Look, I get it. You know, cows being forced to drink to cows being forced to milk constantly and the amount they contribute to climate change is a huge problem. I drink milk alternatives myself. I drink oat milk because that's apparently the best one for the environment. Also, I like the taste. Uh, anyway, but there is a line where they say, you know, it was nauseating to imagine drinking milk from a person. Breast milk, maybe? You know, like what do babies drink? Because breast milk is pretty much the only carbon neutral option. 
<laughs> when you're feeding a child because you don't, you know, formula, they have to make it, they have to package it, it has to come in these special like vacuum sealed packs because it has to be sterile, something I didn't realize when I was feeding my babies <laughs> formula once in a while. Uh, yeah, so uh, that seemed kind of not very what, well, that line seemed a little bit not thought out. Maybe it was supposed to be kind of hyperbolic, but then it seemed to defeat the purpose it was making because that kind of negated the whole argument for me. I mean, I was on board with the argument to begin with, but then that line came up and I was like, that kind of seems stupid. <laughs> Thing is, I was able to overlook instances like that because there were a few other things like that because I actually really enjoyed the cozy aspects. I liked the characters. The humans I didn't find as interesting. They all kind of felt the same. But the animal creatures were really fun. There is this one animal creature, Whistle, who's forced by his programming because they're kind of like... They've got like limiters in their brains and stuff. I don't know. I can't remember. Um, anyway, so it's programming him to have less than analytical mind than he really should have. And I really liked that kind of arc that he has. There's a sentient train who is the polar opposite of Blaine from the Dark Tower. So very, very friendly. <laughs> And there's a snarky AI door named Jaguar that I was like, I love that. <laughs> so if you're like, what is this nonsense? I hate that. Yeah, you won't like this book at all. Don't even try it. Um, that's fine. The book just stepped over the line for me for being too cutesy at times. But my line might be further than others because I'm sure some people, as I read in other reviews, just hated that aspect. And that's fine. You don't have to like that kind of thing. One thing I loved about the book was the focus on environmental infrastructure and the way civilization grew and changed as the years went by. If you enjoy games like Civilization, you might enjoy this. In fact, this book got me playing Civ 6 again. I was also super interested in seeing how, at least in the first section, the one city functioned. I thought it was so cool that it was inside a volcano. I really liked all the kind of like the way it was set up. I found that so fascinating, but I'm also a huge nerd for boring little details like city infrastructure in books. So for me, I was like, hee hee hee, where most people would be like, oh my god, stop. I really liked how the three parts were tied together. Small, non-important things like someone choosing the fur color of a creature to a major plot line about developments were crafted in a way that flowed through the novel. Like there was things that referenced back to the first part. There were things from the first part that only made sense in the last part. It was just very well conceived in that way. And what I really enjoyed seeing was kind of chaos theory at work to, you know, the Jurassic Park version where, you know, humans simply being humans, creatures being creatures are kind of naturally dismantling the corporate kind of setup that these very rigid companies kind of want to impose on the planet. I really liked seeing how that came about naturally over time. Another thing I really loved about the book was the insults. Everyone talks so nicely and politely to one another, but then when they are mad, they drop these really funny insults, like calling someone a giant barrel of untreated sewage or swearing, saying shit in a pit. It had me laughing so much because it just kind of like came out of nowhere. And I was like, that is a hilarious thing to call someone. There are also some really funny or engaging descriptions that I found fun because the book doesn't take itself so seriously when it comes to like the prose. <clears throat> it's kind of ties into like the cutesy aspect of it. The thing is though, that might also be why people are put off by it. The book has a bit of a tonal issue. The concepts, especially that of the treaties, are so serious, but the book has a lot of twee cuteness to it that almost belies the serious aspects of the book. It balanced well for me, but I can see how other people would find it kind of incoherent in that way. That being said, I thought the focus on the treaty was so relevant to our world today, and I thought it was really well done, showing how fragile and intangible these things can be and how they're often ignored or kind of circumvented, especially by corporations and governments. So I live in Canada. We have a complex system relating to our indigenous peoples. Our history is awful and bloody, and just like those of most colonized places. And the treaties in this country are also very important to the indigenous groups. What's interesting is that Canada is technically a constitutional monarchy. We're part of the Commonwealth of the UK, if you didn't know. We have a governor general who basically has to sign things on behalf of the crown. I think it's nonsense that we're still tied to that tired old institution across the ocean. In fact, I think it's stupid. Uh, I used to think that we should break from it and I assumed our indigenous peoples would want to as well, given most of colonialism was because of that empire. Uh, but then I read about how if we were to break from the UK, the treaties that the bans signed would essentially crack and be null and void, leaving them off worse than they are now because they'd have to redo the treaties with the new, like, um, 
the new non-constitutional monarchy, whatever we would be, uh, government. And uh, there's no way that they would get a lot of the stuff that they actually do have in the treaties they have now. It's obviously more complex than that, but I'm trying to do like a very Coles Notes version here. And so the treaty stuff in this book, I thought really tied into what's happening in Canada in a lot of ways. And so I was really into that aspect because I have done some reading on it and my sister volunteers with an indigenous rights group and tells me this kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I just thought the way the focus on the treaties was really, really well done. Unfortunately, from a writing perspective, I found the prose engaging in the dialogue, but there is a lot of passive writing that I was surprised wasn't caught in the editing so much. She noticed this. He noticed that I was like, this is basic stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I mean, this is a longer review than I intended. I, I guess I'll say overall that while I understand why a lot of readers probably didn't like this book, I actually really enjoyed it and I thought it was was really good. <laughs> but then again, I'm not, I don't have a problem with cutesy stuff and I'm very much into environmentalism. And yeah, there we go. So check out the live show that's coming up. Uh, we'll see if Steph disagrees with me. I'll see if she can change my mind. 